Sunday, September, near the end of September. I thought it was time for an update. That's where my exercise ball lives during the day. I haven't used it in quite a while, but I hesitate to get rid of it because at one point my back was so bad. Water, dog food, and there's my cage that I live in at night. It's basically, I think there's gotta be some sacred space where the dogs can't get you and I'm not living in their debris, their mud and their constant hair and all that business. This lantern with the colored USB lights is a new addition and I'm enjoying that because it hardly uses any of my power. It's about half a watt that it draws. I'm planning to add some sort of USB light around here as well. I'm enjoying my new kitchen wall, which has got stuff off the counter, and my two new shelves that I put up. And then there's the doggies. We had a good walk this morning. So that's kind of our routine. You know, get up fairly early. We were out on the trail by 7.30ish. Yes, Sadie, we were. I said the word trail. Oh, yeah. So after the morning walk, which sometimes I do the full 5K, today I just did like three in a bit. Then it's like coming to the laundromat. Oh, I'm bright, eh? Okay, that's better. Coming to the laundromat, it's cheap. It's like 275 for a wash. The only thing is, is that <clears throat> at least half the machines aren't working. And the further caveat is that there's only two dryers that work. So you kind of have to get in line or I'm, I'm surprised. I'm actually first in line today. Um, but I did get here a little bit earlier, actually before nine. So I do my laundry. I do a little bit of cleanup around, um, here while I'm waiting for the laundry. Usually I wash the couch blanket as well, but these two, they're, they're sleeping right now and there's hair and there's mud, sand, little doggy footprints all over it. So I'll probably wait to this afternoon and then pull the blanket and the pillows, sweep them all off, put them back on. And then um, I go for a swim if I'm motivated and a shower. Anyway, so that's my routine for a Sunday. And then today, there's going to be an extra stop that's kind of exciting. I am going to be going to my friend Tracy's. She has been extraordinarily kind to have kept, you know, my van for me, which is still not on the road, and kept a uh, you know, a small amount of storage in her garage for me, which is so amazing. But I have three 100 watt Renogy panels and if all goes well, they'll be on the roof tomorrow. So my work, so Wes at my work, he wants to help teach me and help me get those panels going so that I can not have such a precarious situation with always over discharging my battery because I've you know I've all but it's not dead dead as the last one but you know in less than a year I don't I've already done significant harm to it by over over discharge of it so a 12 volt battery contains 12.6 volts and we had a customer recently who said well I don't know why you know my battery should be dead um, so what would happen was Wes charged them up to the full 12.6 volts and then he put like a tester on it which um, will then apply a load of like 90 amps and the second that the 90 amps load went on the battery dropped from 12.6 to 4 and it was sudden and uh, Wes referred to that as a catastrophic drop in voltage. So. Um, essentially, I was like, well, uh, the customer said that they've been monitoring carefully and they never let the battery go below 11.8. And he went, oh, that's dead. So essentially, 
a 12.6, a 12 volt or 12.6 volt battery is at 50% of its capacity if it goes down to 12.1. Meaning you're killing your battery, right? So these, these lead acid and flooded style batteries are so vulnerable that you pretty much, you have to be, I would say traveling and driving every day for a significant amount of time. And I'm gonna say that's gonna be, I mean, in the winter I was doing about 20K a day, 20 kilometers, and that wasn't enough. So you, if you're going to be doing, not traveling every day, you know, a significant number of hours on the road, um, then you pretty much need to go lithium uh, and, and have some kind of additional power to charge those batteries. Either you're connecting to the shore power through plug-in at a park in the evenings, or, um, or you've got you know, a full solar setup. So that's what I'm looking at uh, building right now. Um, I, have, I have a 100 amp hour lithium battery that's going in. I've got 300 watts of solar, uh, 40 amp um, charge controller, and um, I have a 1000 watt sine wave inverter. So that will supply like a three prong plug, I think, on, right on the unit itself so that I'll be able to charge things that require like a normal plug. Um, and that should be enough, especially in the summer, 300 watts is more, because I hardly use any power. It's essentially the control board of my propane fridge that draws power. Um, that's the biggest power that I use because these little RV overhead lights, which I hardly use, um, they draw it next to nothing. Uh, I think Wes said that your average RV light would draw in the range of like 0.3 of an amp. Not that I know really what that means. I just know that it's a lot smaller than, than a number, than a hundred watt light bulb, right? Uh, draws a hundred watts. That's a lot to, for a continuous, for, for just one battery to handle. Anyway, this is fun. I'm learning, I will get back to investigating what all these things mean. But essentially, it's the control board of my fridge that my coach battery is supplying, and I've managed to kill it just with that. Um, and very minimal light use in the evening. I mean, think of it, in the summer, it's fr freaking light till 10 o'clock at night, like, I, you know. And um, also in the winter, I would sometimes reach over from bed and turn on the furnace and I would run the furnace for maybe 10 minutes, five minutes, um, just to take the, the edge off of the chill in the morning. And then sometimes I would do the same thing again. I would run the furnace for five or 10 minutes in the evening. So that's just the fan and uh, whatever electrical controls, cause it's again, it's propane. So, and, uh, and all the while, propane I have um, a I believe it's a 30 pound tank and typically I will go through about 32 to 34 dollars of propane a month so really very little um, in terms of an overall you know conservation you know point of view I also use very little water So in spite of the big, uh, it's the Ford E350 engine, it does burn a fair bit of gas, uh, like a lot of gas uh, for getting around. Um, yet generally I don't travel that much and that's why the battery has really become an issue. So I've just made a short story really, really long, but hopefully tomorrow, we're, we're going to be at least part way into business for having the solar up. I'm sure at least we'll get the panels on the roof, um, whether or not the whole thing is hooked up, you know, but I plan to get some footage of that tomorrow. And, uh, you know, if, if Wes is comfortable, I'll, I'll get him, you know, some of him uh, in the video as well. 
Cheetahs and the girls. Yes, all the girls. Yes. See, because this is my Jackery. That's my Jackery 240 right over there. And then I have a little blue light. And it provides me enough light for most of the things. I also have this that bottle. I don't know if you can see it. This bottle has a string of USB lights in it. And that provides a ton of light. So it's uh, it's been... I haven't charged that. And I can't even... Is that 52% capacity right now? Uh, after I haven't charged it in weeks, and uh, because it's lithium, that's okay. I can, I can go as down. I can go as far as 80% of capacity used with lithium without causing damage to it. I used to recharge every day. I think because when I was living at the off-grid cabin, I was always so nervous of you know, what if it's a cloudy day and I'm only getting 12 watts out of my 100 watt panel and, you know, at 12 watts, that's what I worry about the winter. So it could be that I'm only going to get 30 watts in, like 10 watts, so uh, only 10% efficiency out of my 100 watt panels. I worry about that for the winter when it's really rainy and dark and all of that, uh, which I may then have to drive a little bit more. I uh, definitely don't want to hurt my lithium battery, so I'll have to look into how I can get a better monitoring system for that. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I used to be all paranoid about, oh my god, what if it's cloudy? So I would recharge my batteries every day. So they'd be at like 88 or 85 or 90 or 92 and I'd charge them up. Now I was like, you know what, Let, let's just see. Let's see how long they last. The little Jackery 160 that's in the bedroom, it has been, you know, charging my phone and streaming and, and all of that um, for over a week. I think I'm down into the 60s right now with that. So I'm just curious. It's like I'm powering most of my life and my entertainment, well, all of my entertainment off of Jackery. Um, so there's no, no draw on my coach system for that. There's no way to even actually draw on my coach system, uh, for that, but that'll change with the new system. So I'm going to sign off before I just, uh, complete, you know, complete verbal blah, 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 blah. Anyway, <laughs> take care and thanks for sticking with me this far if you're still here. These triple loaders are only five bucks. In spite of the state of disrepair and poor cleanliness of this uh, laundry facility, I actually really like coming here because nobody bothers me. Um, you know, so many of these laundromats now, um, like you'd be paying six, seven, sorry, six, eight, even ten dollars, you know, to use the washer. And they're just so particular about, is that a blanket? Is that a blanket you're trying to put in there? And then now they have a thing where it's like, you, you can't wash that. You have to pay eight dollars if you want to wash. So it's like, you know, this minuscule little load that wouldn't have filled a standard. Now you have to like pay eight bucks if you want to wash it. And you know, uh, per week that's gonna add up. Um, so out here, you know, nobody bothers me. Uh, I may have to wait in line for the dryer, but it's just not being a hassle because life has enough hassles and people, there's enough people always looking over uh, looking over one's shoulder, uh, especially when you're living this lifestyle, you know, uh, they see you drive in a van, a camper van or an RV, and you know, you're immediately suspect. And so I actually did a work, I, I did a, like a work-related visit um, to a lady's house. Um, I think it was last weekend, actually. And so I, I parked at the end of the road because the road was narrow and it was a dead-end road and actually at the dead end there was a park like a trail 
So I parked there and I, I walked up and I met with the lady and then I, you know, I came back. I happened to be chatting with someone who had just pulled up and was going to go hike. I was saying, oh, what's that trail, blah, 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 we're just chatting. And this guy pulls up in a pickup truck and he's like, can I ask you what you're doing here? Um, and and I, was, I was like, uh, I'm just having a quick conversation. And he's like, no, but how long are you staying and what are you doing here? Uh, and I said, I, I actually am here for a work-related thing. And, and, I, and he said, what kind of work? And I was like, I said, you know, I don't, I don't need to answer any more of your questions. Um, like, I'm not doing anything wrong. And he's like, this is a residential street and I live here and you can't be here. And it was like, wow, you know, it was the middle of the afternoon. And I said, you know what? Maybe if I was here overnight, I could see. But I said, I've been here like an hour. And he goes, you've been here for hours. And it just wasn't true. You know, I had been just about an hour there and was actually preparing to leave when he came and accosted myself and the other fellow who was talking to me who drove up in his fancy electric car. So go figure that one. And um, Anyway, so the, the man was like, it's none of your business what we're doing here. You know, we're not doing anything wrong. We have every right to be here. Um, so anyway, this man in the pickup truck, he totally disagreed with that. You know, we didn't have any right to be on the public road that he lived on, in his opinion, especially if you're driving what I drive. So that happened, but I wasn't that upset. I think I've gotten used to it now. But it is annoying to always be, like sometimes it's annoying. I am getting used to that as well though, being always like looked at as if you're up to something, right? Um, there was this, you know, they're very sensitive to anybody sleeping overnight in a, in a vehicle of any kind, right? But reality is there is a housing crisis. Uh, the reality is that most people working for a lower wage cannot afford today's market rent. Uh, so there's more and more people that are living in vehicles and I, I see it. I see them. I see it. And uh, most of them are people that they get up early in the morning and they move on, right? So uh, my friend Darren, he was actually saying that there was kind of like this legal case that came up where uh, what was argued was, does a person have a right to sleep? So if you're poor, homeless, working poor, at risk of homelessness or whatever, do you have a right to sleep? Um, I, I, I totally disagree with this whole people that are camping out on the streets putting filth and garbage everywhere and doing drugs, that should not be allowed. But you know, if you are minding your own business and doing your best to live your life, I believe you should have the right to sleep. Um, and the right to continue to try and better your situation without constant, essentially, harassment, you know. Um, this hole not in my backyard. Well then where? I mean, I'm not going to go downtown. Like, it's dangerous down there because they, they allow people to be on drugs and addicted to drugs just out there, you know, and uh, without any proper treatment or, like there, there needs to be a change. There needs to be some kind of treatment for people in that scenario because it makes it unsafe for everybody and it really hurts the downtown and all the businesses that are trying to, you know, make their ends meet, right? There's a lot of small business still. Um, and Victoria downtown is not yet a ghost town, but the more that this problem goes unaddressed, the more that the streets smell like urine, the more that there's always somebody uh, like, hunched over and yelling and screaming. It's scary, it is scary. So I don't agree with that. 
but I do think for people that are otherwise, you know, keeping the peace, not making a mess, there should be places where we are allowed to sleep. There, there should also be probably some place that if you're having engine trouble where you can get towed to until you can, you know, access services and best get yourself back, you know, on track. Ignoring the problem, not doing anything about it, uh, it harms society as a whole. And uh, we certainly seem to have enough money to be shipping it overseas to help people overseas. How about sharing it, you know, help your own population that are here as well as helping people overseas that need help. The other thing that's great about this dryer. Hello, everybody. Hello is that it is so hot that you have to keep an eye on it or it'll set your clothes on fire. But the good news is four quarters and my laundry is dry. And actually I've got some that I've pulled out already after one quarter and I just stopped watched it. It's like 12 minutes you get for one quarter. Like, wow, you know, uh, where in the world now can you find that? Right? So I've seen them be as high as even $12 at other places. And then you have that constant scrutinizing, you know, they're always eyeballing you. And I just find it so uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. Ugh. It's nice just to be left to do your own thing. And I, I think about this whole scrutiny, right? Um, so if you had an overly particular parent who was scrutinizing how you wash your hands, how you play with your toys, like I, I think it's really important for, for kids to grow up where they can have some completely unself-conscious free playtime. So make the environment completely safe, make it so that the environment that they're in, that there isn't anything within their reach that they aren't allowed to touch. So I did that with my daughter. And uh, other than the wood stove, the, the house was completely childproof. Any lower cupboard uh, had things in there that, were, that she could touch. My cleaners were way high up that she couldn't reach. Um, so I had like Tupperware, pots and pans, you know, nothing sharp. And I had nothing, you know, on the windowsills or on the table. Or, so basically she had free reign and she could just, you know, explore and play without having to become self-conscious via a correction. Hey, 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 don't do that, you know. And uh, it makes such a difference because there was this kid I knew, um, you know, my son's age, and he was brought up with like, you, you could actually be washing your hands wrong. Oh, I was just saying um, how, how I think it's really good when you're a kid to be able to be in a safe environment where you can play. Yeah. And, where you don't have, where everything that you are able, that's within your reach, yeah. is okay to touch. Yeah. You know, it's safe, <laughs> so that you're not constantly like, so that you can kind of get into a mode where you, you can play and be relaxed and not always be like self conscious, like don't do that, <gasps> don't do that. <gasps> you know what I mean? Like yeah, a lot, of, a lot of parents are like you're saying. A lot of parents are, are don't do this, don't do that. See, uh, funny talking about that. I have a daughter that's uh, 15 years old. Now. 50, yeah, okay. okay. Well, that was super interesting. So, I mean, you see how random things can be? You know, you just start talking to somebody. I was talking to myself, I was talking to the camera, and he walked in, and next thing you know, we're having a conversation, and I'm getting a sense of living history out of, like, he's literally a van life guy from the 70s. Wow. Anyway, he lives on a boat now. 
he's a little bit nuts. But, uh, you know, has his daughter still, has a granddaughter who became a grandson, as is, you know, quite common these days. Um, and, uh, yeah, quite the story. I asked him if I might interview him and get some more of his life stories. And he said he didn't want to, you know, do that because he was, he said he was interviewed by the CBC, someone from the CBC about, you know, the life of being sailing back and forth between Vancouver and Vancouver Island. And that he said she was beautiful and that she leaned in and gave him a kiss on both cheeks and said, if anything's to happen between us, it has to be a secret. I guess it all went very wrong. He fell in madly in love with her, called her way too many times on the toll-free number. But he said it started out that, and this may be true, who knows. He said it started out that uh, he would call in and request a certain song and then she would play it. and. I guess, I guess in his mind, he wanted to move things onto another level, but she eventually said, hey, I've had enough, stop calling this number, and, uh, and he didn't stop right uh, soon enough. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, things didn't uh, go so perfectly for him with his uh, romantic uh, notions and things. Well, we, as young people, we can all have that uh, freaking uh, debacle or problem happen, right? A little bit of heartbreak. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've had it where an ex, an ex calls way too many times and leaves way too many messages. Nowadays, we call that stalking. Nowadays, that's practically, or it's illegal. Um, even texting someone. Now it's even not quite legal to email someone without permission. Now it's like you have to consent to being contacted. Um, and yeah, of course, you shouldn't be able to stalk somebody, but it it's almost getting to the, the stage where we're going to have to get written consent to, to say hello to someone on the street anyway that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other query I'm totally not in favor of people that repeatedly contact someone who has said please don't that's a whole other story but uh, yeah life in the 70s eh? seat belts became a thing suddenly we had to wear seat belts um, my dad used to make me wear a seatbelt before it was a law. Uh, having a few drinks and getting into the car didn't seem to be a big deal. Hey, do you want to have one for the road? That used to be a thing. Uh, you know, not to mention people flashing children. Uh, it happened to me a lot. Um, it happened in the neighborhood. You know, it, it just, it wasn't uncommon. Um, being cat called, grabbed, you name it, it was almost like, anyway, nobody really batted a huge eye over it. Whereas now I was working at the liquor store and some customer made a comment about my, and uh, the manager was just through the roof over it, you know, asking me if I was okay. Like, I grew up in the seventies. I'm okay. <laughs> you know? Well, that was interesting. Now on to the next phase, which is swimming and showering. The Sunday routine, which I'm really, really enjoying. It's so nice to have a routine to fall back on. And as much as I do like uh, some spontaneity, it is so nice to have a routine that grounds me so that when life otherwise feels chaotic, I can always just sort of fall back on myself. I've got my own back. I've got my own back now, finally. It took a long time to learn that. It's true, I'm a very open-hearted, 
person and I used to just give and give and give and because I was able to see or understand that oh, okay maybe that person has this issue or that issue and so I would I would like accommodate for that but that's not something that you can do or sorry I'm gonna own that that is not something that I can do for my entire life I just found I was getting to the point where it was starting to drain me and it's like Grazia once said to me she said Carol you scatter your pearls before the unworthy and again worthiness it's not some mysterious force that you're either born with it or you aren't it's how you show up if you show up worthy then you're worthy it's as simple as that and it's being willing to show up it's willing to be there showing up in someone's life as devoted as loyal as trustworthy all of those things you're worthy and I have to now, or I have been, and I'm being more careful to, you know, protect myself from going into situations where, you know, what that person, like that person's willing to give this much every so often. And I can't spend that much time with people that are like that anymore because I don't have an off switch. I have to just try and fill my life with people that are built similarly to myself. It's not wrong to be one of those, you know, comparative breadcrumb people. It's not wrong. It's just vastly different and open-hearted, giving, don't think twice about showing up. People are not, uh, I think, really meant to not meant to like mix over the long term with with the breadcrumbing folks or comparative breadcrumbs right you know like the kind of person that you could show up and trim their hedges uh, because they have a terrible back pain or knee pain so you show up and you do all this like hours of maintenance for them and help them out with things and then when you ask them, hey, I, I kind of need to go over something. Um, will you listen? Will you listen to what I've I've written for you know? And we're talking 15, 20 minutes, and then the answer is no. Um, so like repeatedly, of showing up in one way or another. Oh my God! There is a cool looking vehicle um, with a dog. Uh, okay. Anyway, so showing up worthy. That's. You show up worthy, you're worthy. It's not rocket science. It's not like you have to be some vastly Mother Teresa kind of person to all people at all times. And, you know, to someone who I really think is a great person and a great survivor, you know, just because you snap at someone every now and then when you're having a bad day, does not make you unworthy. You know, it's, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I snapped. Or even the next day, hey, I'm sorry I snapped, I was really in a mood. It's more how you respond, I think, overall, after the fact. And how often is it that, that you kind of, hi puppy, hi sweetheart, oh, little baby boy. Oh my God, you're so cute. Oh, how am I going to get out of here? Oh, now we've got a scooter parked there as well. So that's going to be really tough. Tough. Mama. Andre's Mama. texting me. Mama. Mama. That's Andre. Mama. I've seen so many this year. Miss you too, Mama. Oh, that's sweet. RV living, you have got to be good at patience. Uh, you know, finding right parking for stuff and also good with the minute 60 point turn, never mind the three point turn, it could be the 60 point turn. 
So, you know, it's like inch by inch, it gets accomplished. It is doable. Oh, what does they say? Inch by inch, RV parking is a cinch. I think they said life, but anyway, I'm gonna adapt that. Got that text from my son. I'm so glad he looks for four leaf clovers too. I'm so glad. To me, it represents an optimism about the mystery. You know, I mean, I, I didn't even think they really existed. So this might sound weird because my history with his father is not great in terms of the quality Nothing terrible, super terrible, but just really not great. But I am very grateful for that. He taught me to look for four-leaf clovers. He taught me that they exist. You just have to look, you know. You look and you shall find. <laughs> and I had texted my son a few days ago or a week ago, you know, I found this patch with about four four-leaf clovers and one five-leaf love that. Sometimes I really feel like I need to see a four-leaf clover, you know, somehow it helps me keep the faith. Just before I got this job, I looked, really feeling like I needed a sign, and I, uh, I found one, and like within a day, I found the job. Yeah, the job at the, the RV shop, and I love it. I'm learning so much. I feel so much better. Triple shampoo and half an hour in the pool, swimming laps. So I feel a lot more yeah, loosened up and on with the rest of the day, which at some point, maybe breakfast will be a thing. And gotta go collect the solar panels today for tomorrow's install. falsely romanticizing this life because there's a lot of things that are definitely challenging, sometimes annoying, sometimes depressing, sometimes scary, but I have to say, just being able to go and visit anyone or anywhere with your house, I love it. Just reviewing and editing the video, and I wanted to add, when it comes to funding things that help people living in Canada, both citizens and, um, you know, documented folks that are not citizens, um, that wonderful program that I'm in that helped me get my job because, you know, I was new to the field. So what they do is, it's called uh, Work BC. And it's basically a program where they will pay part of your wage for up to six months, depending on the job and the field. And uh, so I had my final visit to the workplace last week. And for me, the program ends on October the 8th. And I was told that they can't write any more 
assistance uh, subsidy, wage subsidy contracts until next year in April. Is that six months? And you know why? Because the federal government didn't give them their money. So they only went on uh, what the province had allotted to it. And every year they've been getting federal money around this time of year and they didn't get it. So for six months, essentially, they're shut down. So Canadians that, sorry, not just Canadians, Canadians and uh, landed uh, immigrants and work permit folks will not be able to take advantage of the wage subsidy program because our federal government, in their wisdom, doesn't feel that it's worth the money. Isn't that something? Anyway, I am now a full-time employee and a taxpayer as a result of this program. So, anyway, to me that just seems a bit, hmm, how do you say it? What's the word that I'm looking for? Yet how many millions, or is it billions, that we're sending overseas to fight wars? You know, and okay. All well and good, let's help people that need help. But we have to be able to take care of our own um, residents of, of the country. You know, we still have people on the street with nowhere to live. And I don't think that's okay. This has really evolved. It started out as this little, I called the coffee shop. And now they've added this thing in the back and this here, this post with all the feathers and they've got a fire pit area over here. I know one of the longtime locals who was part of celebrating right here at this spot. They were having little campfires in the spring. And right over there, see that tire? That was the tire that washed up on the beach that Sadie had an absolute conniption over. The heart's been heavy. They noticed at work, actually. The father and the son, they both asked me if I was overwhelmed at work or getting burnt out on the job. And uh, I was like, no. It's actually more of a refuge coming into a place where I feel really appreciated because they tell me frequently enough and where I feel like I have a purpose and where I can use my skills to move things forward fill in the gaps learn how to fill in the gaps to make it easier you know to get where we need to go for the customers and uh, the RV industry is a really underserved uh, bit of clientele, you know, in this part of the world. It is seriously undersaturated with providers. Look at this beautiful tree. Oh my God, it's kind of dead. Look at that though. Can you see all the bumps on it? Anyway. <laughs> but no, I said nope. It's family. Disconnection from family. And it's just sort of a sad resignation, right? Because there's nothing I can do. They're not wrong. We just have a very very different view of what it means to be family. Um, I think of that side of the family as fair weather family. I don't know how many times I've heard it said, it's not convenient. Um, so regardless of what's going on, it could be a pretty serious thing. And there has been things, you know, once or twice in the last 30 years, so not all the time, where it was kind of serious. And I was 
when I reached out, I was told it wasn't convenient. Anyway, it's just different, right? I believe more in showing up. Showing up as fully as possible for people that I love and care for. But I've learned in recent years I have to be a little more careful because I don't know how to half show up. I don't know how to show up once in a while. I'm kind of an all-in sort of person. And my only defense is to keep my distance from those that aren't that built that way. And they aren't built that way. And uh, there's been this remarkable uh, ability to shut down the conversation and gaslight all at the same time, which is if I ever had any kind of a complaint, if I ever said, hey, you know, that really hurt my feelings when you, when this happened, I'd be said, I'd be told, you're trying to guilt trip. So, okay. So literally, I can't say anything. Yet, they could say and do whatever they want um, and do. And uh, I can't say a word. Or I'm manipulating and guilt tripping. And I mean, we're talking about uh, family coming to my house, staying with me and making a dinner for two when I'm there and not even inviting to feed me when they're staying at my place. So, I need to make a list of all of these things that are really blatant and be like, you know what? As sad as it is, I now see that it is a duck. It looked like one, it sounded like one, and it walked like one, and yet... Why did I think that it wasn't one? Why did I gaslight myself about that? Anyway, them days are over, and uh, I have to adapt once again to that feeling of heartbreak that comes with disconnection from people I valued a lot, equal to myself, put ahead of myself many times, put their needs and their ahead of myself, you know, because I thought, oh, well, they're not around that much. So let them have the run of the house. They don't get to see each other that much. And so I was, I was fine with it because it was, I mean, I don't think I knew any different, but I was fine with it because I could kind of just get busy doing my own thing because I had my house, I had my neighborhood, I had my friends. So I would just sort of fade into the background and go start doing my own thing when I was not invited to dinners at my own house. But I am uh, don't have a house anymore. And now for family to get together, it's, you know, a lot more work and money involved and often plane tickets. So it's just not something I'm willing to do anymore. And I've, I've been met with quite the, I don't know, what is it? opposition, resistance, um, I'm just not taken seriously. <sighs> anyway, so I have had their back. I have done lots of things that I even hosted my ex-partner and his new girlfriend when they were visiting from Europe. Why? Because I wanted our child to have time with him. How many people do that? 
welcome their ex-partner's new partner into their home for three weeks over Christmas. But again, I just thought, you know, the child and the well-being of the child is way more important than me being, you know, kind of like whatever. And the thing is, when you think that way, it's actually not that bad. It really wasn't that bad. And I don't regret doing it. But that is the kind of thing that I would do. That is the way that I would kind of put myself out or open my home. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just can't do it anymore. I can't allow myself to do it anymore. So here we are. It's like, keep calm and walk the dogs. Keep calm and walk the dogs and listen to the ocean. Hi. <laughs> and then you always have the comic relief of the doggies. Hey, Sadie. Hey, Sadie. There's the wiggly tail.